Good afternoon and welcome to this talk on approximate algorith algorithms for stream data summarization. My name is Himadri Sarkar and I work for Sumo Logic. Let me start with a demo which will set context for three different approximate algorithms that we'll be talking later. manages and analyzes machine generated data. This is the Sumologic web application which can be used to debug and analyze already ingested log messages. Sumologic's search feature allows you to identify important messages and extract meaningful values and metrics out of them. When you're dealing with millions of log messages, at times it is difficult to write very specific and targeted queries. For instance, this is a query which I ran a couple of minutes ago and it produced around 1 million results spanning across 71,000 pages. Now imagine yourself debugging an ongoing fire in your production systems and you get overwhelmed with 1 million log messages from the same query that you thought was supposed to pinpoint to you to the root cause. Now this is not an ideal state to be in. So what you do is you start with your initial query and further refine it to return lesser and res lesser results in subsequent runs. For that, we needed a feature which can assist our users to drill down further into such a massive result set. First, let me explain to you briefly what is that I'm trying to search. This query here tries to do a keyword search over log messages. These are the keywords. Then it tries to identify a JSON string within the log messages and extract some interesting fields from them. Generally speaking, it is trying to get metrics corresponding to queries that are executed by our customers. Along with the query, we also supply a time range for which we want to search over the data. Now let me run the same query in a separate tab. When I press this start button, it kicks off the search. Now we don't wait for the search to finish. As the search starts producing results, they are streamed to the UI starting from the most recent message to the least recent ones. Remember these are server logs, so each of them have a timestamp from which recency is derived. Along with that, we also display results related to statistics of each field present in the output result set. We call this the field browser. For instance, if I zoom you to the left bottom corner, you can see that while the query is returning results, these values are getting updated in real time. Now what do these values represent? These are the various fields that are present in the output data. You can identify them as columns in a big table. Besides each field name, we display the number of distinct values seen so far. So if you look at this field customer ID, we have seen 566 distinct customers so far. Going further, uh, this number 8000 represents that we have seen 8000 distinct queries so far. And remote IP addresses shows that the users have been firing queries from 200 distinct IP addresses. Now, uh, let us look at each of these fields in detail. If I click on customer IDs, then it shows the top 10 customer IDs and their frequency of appearance in the logs. It also shows a histogram, which is updating in real time, as you can see. Uh, and it gives us a relative idea of this frequency with respect to the other top nine. Similarly for query, uh, for this particular window, uh, we can see that uh, it is displaying the top 10 queries with their frequency of execution. And if I hover over uh, the queries, then it also shows the complete query. We see that uh, we have seen uh, around a uh, half a million distinct session IDs till now and this particular uh, window is displaying the top 10 session IDs by their frequency patterns in the logs. Previously we were trying to analyze logs corresponding to all the customers. Now let us analyze logs of one customer who is running the most number of searches. So I go to this uh, customer ID field name, I click on it and I get the list of top 10 customers. Now, uh, 
to drill down into the search I just need to click on this and then it will open up a open up the same search in new tab but with an additional filter pertaining to that particular customer the search has started and the field browser has started populating again now you can see that the customer field has only one distinct customer because we applied that filter now what you're seeing is data pertaining to only this particular customer now you find that there's just one exit code till now and its value is zero which is very good it means all the queries of this customer have executed successfully we also see that this customer is executing queries from three different IP addresses whatever search results we have returned till now in them there were 17,000 distinct session IDs and going further at the bottom we see that we have utilized 35 host machines to execute search for this customer now you have lots of data points to guide your search nearer to the desired result and hopefully we'll be able to fix the production incident. All right, so uh, that was the demo. And we were trying to do two simple things in that demo. The first thing is we were trying to count distinct values in a stream of data. And within each field, we were trying to count top 10 values. So that seems to be a very easy problem, right? We do counting daily in our lives and Lots of times you might have done in the code that you have written. Okay. So uh, what are the traditional approaches of solving these two problems? It's very easy, right? To count distinct values, you use a hash set. For each incoming element, you insert that element into the hash set. And when the query comes for distinct values, you just return the size of the hash set. Similarly, for counting the frequency of each distinct value, you can use a hash map. Now, hash map will contain the value and their counters, and you will keep imp incrementing that, them. So, uh, let's try to uh, apply scale to this simple problem. Now, what happens when you want to count 1 million distinct elements, where the size of each element is 1 kilobytes? So, it simply translates to the storage requirement of 1 gigabytes. And say you want to do this for 200 fields, then you multiply it by 200 in, and you need 200 gigabytes. I'm not saying this needs to be a main memory. That can be any kind of storage, but still it requires 200 gigabytes. Additionally, if you have to keep counters corresponding to each of the distinct values, from this calculation, if you use uh, long values for them, you need additional 1.6 gigabytes apart from the 200 gigabytes I, saw, uh, I showed you already. And there is one more thing. 10 such queries need to run on one single machine. So that, uh, so we should multiply 10 again, which translates to two petabytes of storage per node. I'm sure no one will allow you to build such a feature uh, which has this kind of requirement. And it, it's just a sim single feature, not a complete product. So there is something we want. What we want is a data structure which has constant memory footprint. Additionally, what we also want to do is we want each of the operations on the data structure to be inexpensive. Now, we cannot have our way with everything, right? We have to trade something in for achieving these kind of things. And let's suppose we, uh, we agree on trading some amount of correctness, uh, where, which gives us this kind of uh, results. So before I go into the solutions of the two problems I described, let us try to gain some intuition from set membership problem. I'm sure many of you have uh, used this, solved this problem in your production systems or have thought about solving it. So uh, what we want to have is a memory efficient data structure that can be used to check membership of an element E in a set S of elements. So uh, as we discussed, that we are ready to trade off some amount of correctness in view of that. I claim that there is a very simple data structure which has just two components. One is a bit string, all initialized to zero initially, and k hash functions. Now, what are the property of these hash functions? They can take in any arbitrary object. They may be integers, strings, or anything, 
and what they will return is an index into the bit array. So uh, now the stream uh, will contain two things, the operation that has to be performed and the value of the particular element on which that operation should be performed. Now let us see uh, how we will keep track of what are the elements present in that particular set. So for each incoming element, we have this operation insert. It will go through all these hash functions. There are k of them. And it will generate k indices into this bit array. So what we will do is we will go to those indices and we will turn on the bits. That will help us keep track of, uh, that will do, what that will do is it will say that this particular element is present in the set. Now, you see one interesting thing. We are not storing E1 anywhere. We are just storing the information that E1 is present in the set. Now, uh, we inserted n elements. So lots of bits will get turned on. Now, what about query? Uh, when the, an element en plus 1 comes and it asks whether I'm present in the set, what do we do? We do a similar kind of uh, application. We uh, go through all the hash functions. We get the indices. We go to those indices. We fetch the values. And we do an AND on that. Now, uh, if the AND returns 1, that means that this particular value is already present in the set. If it returns 0, then we uh, say that it is not present in the set. Uh, but we should be careful about something. It is quite possible that the elements e1 to en that we inserted prior to en plus 1, a combination of those have turned on all the bits for which en plus 1 would have been turned on if it was inserted. So this gives us false positives. But we will see that we can reduce this value of false positives to such a small uh, probability that this uh, particular data structure will still be useful in lots of cases. So without going into the theoretical proof, let us directly jump to the results. So, what, uh, so, so to use this data structure, you just need three things, n, m, and k. n is the total number of elements that you expect will be coming in the stream. M is proportional to the memory that you can u utilize for this, this particular data structure. So what you do is you use, the second, uh, you use the second formula first and compute k. So you get the number of hash functions. Now once you get k, you plug, it, plug n, m, and k into the first uh, formula, and you get the error. If that particular error is suitable for you, you continue with this, uh, these values of n, n, m, and k. Otherwise, you go back. you increase the memory, and you get the new value of error. You do this iteratively. So uh, this, this, this uh, lays path for the first approximate algorithm that I wanted to discuss. And this will help us in gaining intuitive understanding of the original solutions to the problem that we discussed. So this is, uh, I'm sure many of you know about this and have used it. We just described what are Bloom filters. So from our understanding of Bloom filters comes a very uh, interesting family of data structures. Those are the sketch data structures. So uh, imagine these two images. One of them is raw and one of them is JPEG. The raw image is 100 times bigger in size as compared to the JPEG image. But both of them convey the same meaning to you. Then why would we need to store the raw image? So this is something similar we did with the uh, Bloom filters. We did not store the exact values. We did not store the exact E's. But still, it was able to tell us whether any EK was a member of the set. Now, uh, sketches have a very uh, good property, and that is they can be aggregated. Now, that gives us two benefits directly. The first one is, if your data is spread across multiple machines, then you can compute sketches on those individual machines. You can just transfer the sketches to one particular machine and aggregate them. For instance, if you were to do this for Bloom filters, then you would uh, compute the Bloom filters on individual machines, bring them to one machine, and do an OR operation. And that gives you the picture of entire data that was collected in N machines. And N can be very big. All right. So we just wandered off to some other problem. Let's come back to the problem that we were looking at and solve that. So the understanding of Bloom filters not go, uh, will, will not, uh, we'll use the, our understanding of Bloom filters and use it as a role model. So uh, what we'll do again for counting uh, number of 
counting the frequencies that we will not store the exact elements, but we will store just the counters. In previous case, that was a membership operation, so it was 0 or 1. This, in this case, we'll have to store either integer or long counters. And Bloom filters used 1D sketches. Let us improve upon it and use two, 2D sketches. All right. So this is how the data structure looks like that we will use to keep track of distinct counts. So uh, there are multiple bit arrays. Basically, there are D bit arrays of uh, size W. And again, we are good old hash functions are there. There are D hash functions. So how does an insert operation for tracking the count works? So whenever we get an element E from the stream, we pass it through these hash functions. They give us, uh, they give us D distinct indices. We go to those particular indices in the respective bit arrays, and we increment the value. So we are incrementing this time because uh, we want to keep track of count and not just setting the bit to on. And how does query works? So when you want to query, what is the, uh, how many times we have seen x so far? What you do is you do something similar. You uh, pass it through these hash functions. You go to those buckets. You fetch all these values. And your frequency is minimum of all the values that you get. Now we'll see why we are taking minimum. That is because of collisions, right? So for instance, take this example. We inserted x1 and we inserted x2. For h2, that is the second hash function, they both mapped, uh, they both mapped to the same uh, bucket whose value is 21. That means when we insert x1 and x2, every time it goes and increments the same bucket. So there, so this is, over, this is the overestimation, overestimated value, because two different elements are going and incrementing the same bucket. So that's why we take the minimum from all the bit arrays, because that value that we get, it has the least amount of error. And we will see that by choosing appropriate values of the depth and the width of this uh, structure, we can um, have bounds on these errors. All right, again, very simple formulas. Let's uh, go to the results directly. So we have epsilon, which is the accuracy that we want to have. What that means is epsilon is the maximum error that we can tolerate in any frequency value. And delta is the probability with which we want epsilon to happen. So th this very easily gives you the value of width and depth. Width will be given by E by epsilon. E is the base of natural log. And depth will be given by a ceiling of, again, natural log of 1 by delta. Very simple formulas, and it really works. But you should remember one thing while using this particular data structure. Uh, suppose you have uh, counted all the frequencies and you sorted them and you plot that frequency distribution, then it will look like this, right? Because you sorted them. Now, uh, the estimates on the, the estimates near the y-axis are more accurate as compared to the estimates at the end or the tail. That is because many of these estimates at the beginning will also go and increment the buckets in which the tail elements lie. And that will lead to higher overestimation in the tail elements. That's why what we do is we generally use this data structure to keep track of top k distinct frequencies. And that's what we did in the demo that I showed you. We kept track of top 10 uh, distinct frequencies. Now, to keep track of top 10, you have to use an additional very simple data structure. Every time you insert an element into the previous data structure, you get the final count. And then you check whether, uh, any, whether it can displace any of the elements in the top 10. Uh, if, if it is true, then you insert it, and one element gets spilled out. So every time you keep track of top uh, k, elements. So what I just described is a very uh, useful data structure known as count min sketch. This is not a new data structure. It is a time-tested data structure, but it has become very popular today because of huge amount of data and the need to process it fast. All right, coming to the second problem. How do you uh, keep track of cardinalities? Now, if you had used a uh, hash map, then you could have tracked both frequencies and cardinalities, but we didn't store the values. So it will be very difficult to uh, go back to using count min sketch itself to keep track of cardinalities. So for that, we have, we'll look at this uh, another data structure. And before we directly go to the data structure, let's have an intuitive understanding. So uh, this time, 
Our hash function is a little bit different. It is not outputting uh, integer or long values, but what it will output is a real number in between 0 and 1 for every incoming element x. So, uh, and the good thing about hx is it will uh, distribute all the elements uniformly across this uh, number line, which is from 0 to 1. So what it means is if you insert 10 distinct values, then they will lie at a distance of 0.1 from each other. So uh, this good property uh, gives us a very good insight into how we can compute cardinalities. What we can do is we can just keep track of the smallest value that uh, smallest hash value that this data structure has produced. Now, because our assumption was that this particular hx will uniformly distribute the values, that smallest value will be the distance between any two uh, elements. So, uh, to count, to estimate the cardinality, uh, so you, you just divide the total range that is 1 by uh, distance average distance between, between any two elements that is 0.1, and which gives you the cardinality as 10, and in actual, we had eight elements, so it is, this is very uh, much near to the actual estimate. Now, of course, you will say that keeping track of the smallest one might be inefficient. It might give huge bias. So what we can do is we can go forward and keep track of the k smallest values this time. So even this is not accurate. Uh, for this case, say the kth smallest value seen is 0.3. You plug it into the formula, you get 6.7, but that is more nearer to the cardinality uh, that, that we got in the previous uh, example. So this is the basic understanding with which uh, cardinalities are determined using approximate algorithms. So uh, let's go ahead and change our hash function again. This time, our, say our hash function uh, outputs a bit string in which each bit has 50% probability of being turned or on or off. Then we can easily uh, understand from our, uh, from, then we can easily say that, you know, there is 50% probability that any of the hash function, hash values generated will have one in the first position and anything, it can, it can have anything uh, later on. And we can say with 20, we can say that there is 25% chance that any of the hash values will have 0, 1 in the first, 0, 1 as the first two bits and anything rest after that. So on and so forth. So what this uh, tells us that if we unique four hash, if we, if we hash four unique things, at least one of them will begin with 0, 1. If we hash eight unique things, at least one of them will start with 0, 0, 1. Conversely, let us converse them and then we'll see that if the lowest index of 1 in 2 is, uh, sorry, if the lowest index of 1 in the bit array is 2, then you can say that there are 2 raised to 2 distinct elements present in the, uh, in the data structure. If the lowest index of 1 is 3, then we can say that there are 2 raised to 3 distinct elements in the data structure. And I'm counting 1 from uh, left hand side. But again, there might be some skewed data, uh, skewed data which might give you uh, wrong estimates. So what we do is we, mul we maintain multiple estimates and then combine those estimates to get a single cardinality value. So what is be basically done uh, from the hash values that first k bits are chosen to index into a particular bucket, and the rest of the m minus k bits will be used to do what we just saw uh, to determine cardinality. And then we combine the cardinality from all the k buckets and get the final estimate. Now, let me uh, give you a more intuitive example if this doesn't make sense at all. Say uh, one of you comes here and tells me that he has been uh, flipping coins since morning, and the uh, continuous runs of one that he got, the maximum of them were just two. Then I can assume that he didn't flip the coins a lot of times. But if someone else comes and says that the maximum run of uh, heads that he got is 100, then I'll, uh, I'll, I can easily derive that he has flipped lots, uh, the coins lot many times. Because uh, getting the, the event of getting 100 uh, continuous heads is a very rare event. And that can happen only when the operation, the prior operation has been performed lot many times. So the, the data structure that we just saw uh, is known as hyperloglog. log. log. Uh, this is widely used in the industry today to compute cardinalities. 
So coming back to uh, my demo and let me set some context. So here there were multiple, freak, uh, multiple fields for which we were keeping track of cardinalities and then within each field we were keeping track of top 10 values by frequency. So uh, what we did is we have account means cache data structure and a hyperloglog -log data structure corresponding to each of these fields. So let's see what was the final amount of resources that we used. So we allow 200 fields at max in the output data. Uh, the count means sketch, we chose the parameters of width and depth as 100 uh, and 6, and that works very well for our data distribution and for 1 million uh, results. We chose an error, uh, HLL we chose the hyperloglog -log data structure we chose uh, with a bound of 0.02%. Now you can build this hyperloglog -log in a way that you take the error percentage itself and it, uh, it gives you uh, the values of K and M. And uh, that translates to three kilobytes. So uh, for 200 fields, we need uh, 200 uh, megabytes of memory. And I said in the beginning that we run 10 concurrent queries on a single machine that translates into two gigabytes. So now we can actually do all these operations in memory. And there was just 7% increase in CPU. So we also uh, said that we want a data structure which, doesn't, which is not CPU intensive. Uh, and this 7% increase is because of computation of hash uh, values. All right, uh, that's what I had. Thank you very much. I can take any questions if there are. Uh, hey, hi. So, uh, my name is Sanket. Uh, I have a question on two slides. Yeah. The one where you uh, compute the width and the depth. Yes. Uh, can you get, get the slide, please? It's not Yeah. No, no, I'm asking. So this one, right? Yeah. This one. So, I mean, maybe I lost at this point, but uh, I, I want to know how did you come up with this, uh, come up with this formula? I didn't get, uh, get the depth thing. Like, yeah, so that's what I said, that we will not go into the math behind this. I just uh, uh, presented these results. There is some rigorous math that you need to go uh, in and do for getting this. So we can discuss it offline. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah. And there's an, another one where you had said that... Uh, if we consider a hash function, right, yes. with a 50% probability, you, are, you are uh, have a probability of having one in the most significant place. Yes. With a probability 50, right? 50%. And if you go down, then you will have zero one, right? R right. Then in the next slide, you said that if we have four unique things, uh, at least one of them will start with zero one. But that's yes. again with a probability, right? Because we had, uh, we also had this, have this property of the hash function that it will uniformly distribute uh, the incoming elements across the number line. Right, so it will. So if you have zero one in the first place, mm. then there is probability that uh, there are four elements because you know uh, that is the minimum value that you see. Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, on the same hash function that you are saying that it will distribute it uniformly o yes. over the probability. How will a hash function distribute it? Hash function does not have that much information, right? Yes. So it's not just about a single hash function. You have multiple estimates. And you try to choose good, f good hash functions, but you can definitely not. That's why uh, it's not just a single estimate that you do. I mean, you do multiple hash functions. That's why they, we were using multiple hash functions. It won't be a static uh, manipulation on the data which will give you a unique hash, right? It will have to have a feedback of how many numbers have arrived already. Mm -hmm. And based on that, it will decide what the frequency of this particular number, let's say, this particular element uh, to be in. Like, how will you find out that E1 has occurred this many number of times mm -hmm. if you don't have all the previous elements stored? Yeah, so and that, you know, that's why uh, we had this data structure. This is a sketch data structure. It's a probabilistic data structure. It will not give you very exact values, but by choosing appropriate parameters, it will uh, give you a, some value which is very near to uh, the ex actual value. Okay. And we can do, I mean, you can tune the parameters, of course. Hello. Yeah, maybe I would have understood it wrong. But uh, what I understood from the PPT is like uh, you have a, um, a 
a, a two dimensional array kind of thing where you are storing all the hash and finally you are merging it with all the nodes fine in the yes that you are doing yes. take for example you are passing all the hash what you are saying in the first node it is present now it, there is a huge probability you talking about the bloom filters uh, yeah yeah okay. so the length view which you are de yes. deciding it yes. the length which you are deciding take for example you have decided for the 1000 or you are taken about 2000 there is a high probability that the particular thing element which you are going to count it may not come in the 2000 part mm -hmm. or may it be coming in the last thing and in that case what the result we will be getting will be probably not correct so uh, so to th you are saying that what happens if it spills out if the hash function produces some index which is outside of no so that's why you you cr choose a hash function which ha which outputs the value between 0 and m minus 1 where m is the size of your sketch Take for example, uh, I have a user. Okay, yeah. I'm I'm coming from a website, and yeah. I just want to take a, a user who's coming on uh, online. So, if it is a real time kind of thing, yes, and you are going to check the cardinality, you want to take the top ten kind of result. Okay, you were talking about the top ten. I thought you were talking about bloom filter. Uh -huh. So, if you're taking a top ten kind of thing, in that case, what would what is going to happen? That user might get skipped because there are n number of users already present and within a millisecond you are losing that uh, his data, isn't it? We are not losing the data. For every incoming element we are inserting uh, something. So where the is the position of the 1000 part you will increment in the that uh, matrix? Yeah. Where you will increment that? So we have like uh, k different hash functions, right? Uh. And there are there is a bit array corresponding to each hash function. For each hash function, you get a different index. You go to that index and you increment the value. Yeah. So, the and then you take the minimum of minimum of all the values that you get from the different uh, bit arrays. Hey. Pro uh, yeah. 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 So you said multiple hash functions help. Yes. Uh, so, but won't a single bad hash function uh, basically skew, skew the entire result set? Or increase uh, the error margin. I mean, a single hash function can potentially cause that, right? So, uh, if that does, uh, so that's why that is one of the reasons we use multiple hash functions. Yeah. So, but if you have a single bad hash function, that will skew your, you know, let's say yeah. if you have two hash functions, which gives quite closer result, right? In that okay, case, that you you were talking about yeah. the case in which they are dependent on each other, maybe. Correct. Correct. So. So yeah. So uh, the things like the yes. count will totally be skewed. In yeah, so cases. that's why uh, in case of bloom filters, all the hash functions are mutually exclusive. You have to make sure that hash functions are mutually exclusive. And in case of count mean sketch, you have to make sure that they are pairwise independent. So that, uh, so if you do the derivation, these two things will be uh, used uh, to get the final uh, error rates that we derived. Uh, hey, Himadri. Himadri. Where, uh, okay. Hi. Why there was a need of uh, two-dimensional array? Uh, yeah. Earlier you started with one-dimensional, then you okay, right, so right. So in case of bloom filters, you are saying so. This also comes from the fact that you know, in case of bloom filters, we need more rigorous hash functions. They are mutually exclusive. In case of uh, uh, count mean sketch, those hash functions are pairwise independent. So you know, it, if you choose just a single <laughs> array, uh, there will be a lot of pollution uh, of one counter with uh, because of other counters. No, but you could have. Uh, but there are um, there are actually variants of bloom filters which use 2D uh, sketches. No, no. Uh, so just to avoid the collision, uh, you had that two-dimensional array. But you could have had a bigger uh, one-dimensional array that could have given. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's what uh, I was telling you. That in case of bloom filters, the hash functions have one more property. I just didn't want to go into the verbose details of that. That's why I didn't uh, present that. These hash functions in bloom filters are mutually exclusive. It's more rigorous to build those uh, hash functions as compared to the hash functions in count min sketch. They are just pairwise independent. So pairwise independent hash functions are easier to build. But it's, it, they have a property that they will not work very well if the, uh, if the space that you are uh, updating is same. That's why we have different spaces, as in different bit vectors, corresponding okay. to each hash function. Thank you. Hi. So Hi. yeah, so Sorry. I was curious to know about the error bound, the function of that bounded the error for yes. bloom filters. Yes. Like so, what what were the parameters that it was dependent so upon? So uh, yes, there were three parameters. That is n, m, and k. So n, so n is the total number of uh, elements that you will see in the stream. You have to estimate that somehow because yeah. you have already seen your data, and m is the m is proportional to the amount of memory that you can give to this problem. Okay. So okay. 
so you also talked about that you can combine results from various machines to find out yes. uh, the yes. count and all that's a good so so i was asking so does this error bound remains uh, how does it, it vary with the number yeah. of machines i mean right so when we were talking about count min uh, when we were talking about sketch data structures we saw that i mean i talked about this that you have multiple estimates you combine them when you combine them you have to make sure that you know each of your individual estimates had those uh, uh, parameters that when you combine you get the desired results so yeah so, you know, so I mean, y you have to uh, estimate the value of n upfront. I mean, the mem yeah, after com after combination, what will be n? That is what you have to use for individual sketches. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. N n is m m is uh, n is the size of the bit array. It it depends on how much memory you can give uh, to that. So it if you increase m, you have to give more memory and your error rate decreases.